and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said, I'm not trying to respond to this to, to point out that he doesn't know the Quran. Surah Al An'am, chapter 6, verse 115. Allah says, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدِلًا لَا مُبَدِّلَ لِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ And he read it as, وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Now, if you pick your Quran, you will see that, وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Over here, no, even I cannot see what I'm trying to point. Over here, where my finger is, really? Oh no, it's turned upside down. <laughs> I'm where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said, I'm not trying to respond to this to point out that he doesn't know the Quran. Surah Al An'am, chapter 6, verse 115. Allah said, لا مبدل لكلماته وهو السميع العليم وهو السميع العليم هي ريدتس وهو السميع العليم وهو السميع العليم. now if you pick your Quran you will see that وهو السميع العليم وهو السميع العليم over here no even I cannot see what I'm trying to point over here where my finger is really Oh no, it's turned upside down. I'm where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said, I'm not trying to respond to this to point out that he doesn't know the Quran. Surah Al An'am, chapter 6, verse 115. Allah says, لا مبدل لكلماته وهو السميع العليم وهو السميع العليم هي ريدتس وهو السميع العليم وهو السميع العليم now if you pick your Quran you will see that وهو السميع العليم وهو السميع العليم over here no even I cannot see what I'm trying to point over here where my finger is really Oh no, it's turned upside down. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Peace be upon you all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this this afternoon, this evening, uh, last week we were not able to do this program, and uh, today we are here. Thanks to God, peace be upon you. Salam, uh, Sayyid Adam, Nazir, NSC, Fatima Chin, Salam, Biggie, uh, Tikas, Dalan Katujis, The Realist, uh, Young Breezy. Uh, I see you all. Salam alaikum. Thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah uh let me see this network is stable enough yeah okay so but i was billahi min shaitan rajim bismillah rahman rahim i seek refuge with allah against the against a cursed devil ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إن لي من المسلمين and who is better in speech than one who invites to Allah and acts righteous and says indeed I am of the Muslims that is the submitters هذه سبيلي أدو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن تبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين this is my way I invite to Allah by perception. I and whoever follows me in glory be to Allah, for I am not among the mushriks. That is a put uh, idolaters. Alhakumi Rabbikum Famansha Falyu min Famansha Falyakfu. The truth is from your Lord, so whoever wills let him believe, and whoever wills let him disbelieve. Ya you all lazina aman with Takula or Kunuma as Swadikin, O you who believe, beware of God and be with those who are honest, that is, who are truthful, who are honest. 
So thank you all once again for coming. Uh, you can kindly share the program and let other people also benefit from the lectures, today's lectures, inshallah. Uh, as as I, I initially planned, I, I wanted to give the chance for people to be able to call in the program and then ask, bring in their views and, uh, you know, uh, whatever they have learned so far. Uh, Salam, Sister Al Bashir. Uh, hope you are doing good. You're welcome. Uh -huh. So, <clears throat> initially, that is what I wanted to do. But, however, uh, I've diverted the topic a bit and I want it to be based on the scholars as I did uh, two weeks before. And I want to address certain points that people, you like, people usually listen, like to listen to scholars and they don't actually pay attention to what they are missing. Like there's a missing signal when you're paying attention to the scholars. So I want to just uh, give an aid to like, to give a helping hand as to how to, uh, you know, break down uh, these instances when you are listening to scholars and whatever they are trying to say, whether it's a lie, whether it's the truth and how to break that jinx, you know, in understanding the discourse they are telling, they are, they are discussing. So, Hereby, I want people to understand that when it comes to faith, uh, faith, which defines religion, and when we say religion, is believing in a supernatural being who controls human destiny. So we have people who tell you, no, I don't believe in religion. I don't. If you ask them, do you believe in God? They'll say, oh, yes, I believe there is God. So that means you believe in religion because there's a difference between man-made religion and then the religion which has to do with God. And when, when we say religion with God, it's about surrendering self to God. That is your maker, right? Uh -huh. So that is in Arabic, we say deen, which we all know one word can have multiple meanings, but it's based on the context you're using it that it can fit the criteria you're trying to, uh, you know, allocate it to. Yeah, salam to you, uh, right? Yeah, I see you, brother. Uh, Tom uh, Srednik, I see you. Welcome. So uh, today's topic, I'm going to talk about the devious sectarian scholars, like what they keep doing to the people and how they, they twist their tongues to make you consider something is from God or the book while it is not from the book, as said in Quran chapter 3, verse 78. So I want to give you the helping hand to pay attention clearly and how to, 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 to fish how uh, this kind of games, this this so-called scholars do play with, uh, day in, day out, we were actually paying attention. So that's the helping hand I want to give today. Uh, so hereby, I'll be playing uh, some couple of uh, mainstream uh, I can scholars that people know. I'll be using Yasser Kadi and then Numan Ali Khan. As Last time I view, I, I ended with uh, uh, Yasir Kadi's video where he said, cannot practice Islam without the Sunnah, yeah, right? So we we want to examine that statement and put it to, to, the, to the test and see, do the actual, the scholars actually know what they are telling you or they're just using their whims and desires to speak, right? Uh -huh. so, start by using the last video I played from my last week lecture and let's use that to to break the the notion down today inshallah yeah yes just, just a second Salim can I please Salim, can you have Fadi? Allah says in the Quran, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ If you differ about anything, take it back to Allah and His Messenger. Ibn Abbas said, take it back to Allah and His Messenger means you take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah go hand in hand. You cannot have Islam without the Sunnah of the Messenger of Islam. It's as simple as that.
You cannot have Islam without the Sunnah of the Messenger of Islam. Anybody who comes and says, I only want to follow the Quran is contradicting himself because the Quran tells you to follow the Sunnah. You cannot have the Quran except it comes with the Sunnah. Allah says in the Quran, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ If you differ about anything, take it back to Allah and His Messenger. Ibn Abbas said, take it back to Allah and His Messenger means you take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah go hand in hand. You cannot have Islam without the Sunnah of the Messenger of Islam. It's as simple as that. You cannot have Islam without the Sunnah of the Messenger of Islam. Anybody who comes and says, I only want to follow the Quran is contradicting himself because the Quran tells you to follow the Sunnah. You cannot have the Quran except it comes with the Sunnah. Allah says in the Quran, <laughs> oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god so uh this is yasir kadi uh yasir kadi uh i think it's a, it's a pakistani born it's a pakistani born in uh u.s i think yeah if i'm right but i stand to be corrected uh is it canada or u.s i think u.s so he is, he is just giving his whims and desires without actually stating any reference, any fact whatsoever, without giving any reference from God, just stating his whims and desires without anything to back it up with. You understand? So he's, he quoted a verse. He says, He says, uh, uh, This is Quran chapter 4, verse 59. If you dispute about anything, concerning anything, about anything, when it comes to the matters of deen, right? Then he says, Take it back to God and the messenger. Then he said, Ibn Kathir says, it means take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. He said, Ibn Kathir says, he didn't say God says, he didn't say Muhammad says, no. Ibn Kathir says, it means take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. Good. So this is how the scholars play with your conscience by using their whims and desires because of the pedigree or because of their degrees and the certificates they have earned, the academics, you think they're actually telling you the truth because you, you deem you, you deem to think that this is these are the learned people in front of you. Whilst forgetting that the, it wasn't God who put them in charge of you. They just went to a uh, so-called Islamic st uh, university or whatever, whatever institute, which the prophet has no idea about. And then they were certified. And then they came on the podium talking to you and you think they are telling you the truth because you don't verify what they tell you. You see the problem? Good. So he says, For internazatum fi shayi faruddu illallahi wa rasul. Then he said, Ibn Kathir says it means you follow the Quran and the Sunnah. Then he said, there can never be Islam without the Sunnah. So which means Sunnah determines Islam. Do you see what is going on? That means Sunnah determines Islam. And if we should ask them, where does the Quran make such an assertion? We is nowhere to be found. God never said there can never be Islam without the Sunnah. He never said such. The Islam you have is based on the Quran. Quran chapter 5 verse 3. Al-yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam adina. This is what God says. Quran chapter 5 verse 3. At that time, do these foolish scholars know that that garbage sunnah they have created from the Sahih Buhari books, does it exist? The answer is no. God completed the deen as Islam. 
for the Prophet and of his followers. It was complete as Islam. It was God completing it. It wasn't based on the Sunnah. God completed Islam. You'll be a fool to think Islam cannot stand on its own without the garbage books your scholars have written. Wallahi lazim, you are the dumbest fool ever to exist on earth. To think that Islam, that God says, al yawma akamaltu lakum dinakum, it cannot exist without the garbage books your scholars have written down. You see? So then he went ahead to just propagate what their scholars have indoctrinated them without questioning, right? So Ibn Kathir gives them that legislation and say it means Sunnah. So now he says there can never be Islam without the Sunnah. So if we should ask him, Yasir Qadi, where did God ever say there can never be Islam without the Sunnah? And remember, Islam didn't start with Prophet Muhammad. Quran chapter 42, verse 13 to 14. It was the same religion given to Noah, the same religion given to uh, Ibrahim, the same religion given to Musa, the same religion given to Isa, and the same religion given to Muhammad. So if you say there can never be Islam without the Sunnah, you are the biggest fool ever to exist on earth. Because in the first place, if you are saying that garbage hadith books and the sunnah your damn scholars have written down for you, you think that defines Islam and that is sunnah, then what about Noah? What about Abraham? What about Moses? What about Isa? Where is the sunnah? Did it exist there? How come they have the same religion? And how come, if it's the same religion, I need to follow the Sunnah here before the Islam is complete? Afalat Akilu. Hello. Where is the common sense? Where is the logic? You see, so no wonder when you belong to the sectarian religions, you are deprived of using logic and reasoning. Proper logic and reasoning. So let's listen to him once again. Then you analyze for yourself what he said. Allah says in the Quran, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ If you differ about anything, take it back to Allah and His Messenger. Ibn Abbas said, take it back to Allah and His Messenger means you take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah go hand in hand. You cannot have Islam without the Sunnah of the Messenger of Islam. It's as simple as that. You cannot have Islam without the Sunnah of the Messenger of Islam. Anybody who comes and says, I only want to follow the Quran is contradicting himself because the Quran tells you to follow the Sunnah. You cannot have the Quran except it comes with the Sunnah. <laughs> <laughs> so he said anybody who said he's going to follow the Quran alone is contradicting himself. This is what Yasir Qadi said. Then he said, because the Quran says you should follow the Sunnah. And look, you ask any scholar in this world who said he's a Sunni, he's a Shia, whatever he is. Just say, give me one verse where it says we should follow Sunnah. It doesn't exist. There's no single verse. What they do is they, twerk, they quote verses out of context. From today, I'm giving you assignments, ladies and gentlemen. When you are listening to the scholars, always pay attention. They don't quote verses in full. They quote it either from the middle, either from the top, and either from the end, and they leave it out of context. Then they put their own whims and desires with their scholars to tell you their, their opinions. The, the Sunnis have their own mazhab. The Shia, they have their own mazhab. The Tariqa to Tijaniya, they have their own mazhab that they indoctrinate their followers with. So if you are part of a sectarian religion, you have been blocked from using your IQ, your intelligence to reason. You can reason for yourself. 
It is a scholar who has to reason for you. And when I say scholar, I'm saying the so-called scholars. I don't mean scholars based on Quran chapter 35, verse 28. Innama yakshallahu min ibadi ulama. Huh? Those who fear God the most among his servants are the ulama. And when you say ulama, a learned person. Because when you are learned in terms of what God says, then you can have the fear of God. That is why it says, Quran chapter 17, verse 36. Do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. Right? So when you have knowledge in something, you become a learned person. So that makes you an alim. Uh, an alim. So you become an alim whereby you know because you have studied it and you know it. So you know the precautions. Right? It's just like driving. You go and learn driving. You learn the, the road signs, the rules and regulations concerning the street so that when you are driving, you know the signs and regulations so that you don't cause accidents on the way. So you have the fear of the traffic because you know, you are aware. You understand? The ignorant person is not afraid because he doesn't know what the rule says. He can do what he wants. He's ignorant. But when you are learned, you have the fear in you because you know the consequence of the dangers which can arise. Do you see how the logic works? So when it comes to religion, you are bound to implement your IQ, ulil al-bab, be of those who possess intelligence. This is what God wants from us. This is why God asks us, Afala ta'kilun, will you then not reason? Afala tubsirun, will you not see? Afala tatafakkarun, will you then not uh, reflect? Right? So now we listen to such people and we think they are the knowledgeable people we have in this world. And then they twist the narrative in front of us and then we believe. So if today me, Baba Shuaib, I'm just speaking, somebody is already picturing me in front of Yasir Kadi and then saying, who does Baba Shuaib think he is? When did he grow up? This young guy, what does he think he knows? Oh, really? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so again <clears throat> as he said he said his whims and desires and he's free he said it free of charge nobody held him accountable right now remember quran chapter 33 verse 67 on the day of judgment if you obey such leaders and masters telling you their whims and desires and you obey them this is what you can tell god our Lord, indeed, we obeyed our elder, our masters and our leaders. Inna atana sadatana. That is our masters. Wakubara ana and our leaders. Fadaluna sabila and they misled us from the way. Yes, because you are you are taking what they are saying, and you never verified. That is why God keep telling us, Do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. But here we are. We just keep following what the scholars say. And not only about religion, we just keep following what the politicians tell us. We just kept doing what the doctors say. We just kept doing whatever, wh whoever is in authority says. We don't question. We don't reason. We don't ask crit critical questions. Whenever you are part of any cult, any indoctrination, and they tell you you can't question, you can't ask questions, please vacate that position. You have to vacate fast enough from that place. They don't give you the chance to ask questions. They don't give you the chance to reason. Please vacate that place. I'm serious. Whatever it is, be it in politics, in religion, any aspect of life that you are not given the privilege to use critical thinking, please evacuate fast because there is a big, big bomb set in place where you are. So you need to have that reason. Now I'm going to play another video from Yasir Kadi. And all I'm helping people right now is to use their logic in order to, to reason. And then you fish out the lies and the truth you have been told so that you know the difference on what the scholars, how the scholars play or manipulate your conscience, right? So now the next video is again by Yasir Kadi, listening carefully what he has to say. Who did uh, Abu Dhar al Ghifari asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Hadith is Muslim Ahmed. Abu Dhar al Ghifari asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "How many messengers did Allah send?" 
How many Rasul? And the Prophet said, 310 and something. And this number is something that seems to have some type of power to it because that is the exact number of Badr, right? And it is also the exact number of of 310 and something. Huh? Well, of course, Rasul, yes. And it is also the exact number of the people of Talut who crossed over the river. فَلَمَّا فَصَلَ طَالُوتِ بِالْجُنِّ قَالَ إِنَّ اللَّهُ مُتَلِيكُمْ بِالنَّهَرِ فَمَنْ شَرِبَ مِنْهُ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي When David and Goliath had the fight, and Talut took his army, right? The people who crossed over after that were around 310 and something. So this number, some seems to be recurring in a number of times. So the Prophet said, how many Rasul? The Prophet said, 310 and something. A large quantity, meaning don't trivialize. Just because it's 310, don't think it's trivial. Their quality, their quantity is large, 320 something. So he asked him, and how many prophets were there? And so he said, 124,000. 124,000. This hadith is in Muslim Imam Ahmad, and it is inshallah ta'ala hasan, authentic. And this is another indication that Rasul and Nabi are not the same. And from this we derive, every Rasul is a Nabi, but not every Nabi is a Rasul. Risala is higher. Risala is higher than Nabi, and every Rabbi is a every Rasul is a Nabi, not every Nabi is a Rasul. And out of the Rusul, there are the Ulul Azm who are five. Out of the Rusul, there are the elites of them. Ulul Azmi min al Rusul. And these are, of course, the greatest ones that humanity has ever seen. And these are Nuh and Ibrahim and Musa and Isa and our Prophet Muhammad. And uh, one more point before we move on, and that is that Rasul did. Uh, Abu Dhar al Ghifari asked the Prophet وسلم, hadith is Muslim Ahmad. Abu Dhar al Ghifari asked the Prophet وسلم, how many messengers did Allah send? How many Rasul? And the Prophet said, 310 and something. And this number is something that seems to have some type of power to it, because that is the exact number of Badr, right? And it is also... No. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, these are the scholars you have. Yasir Kadi, quoting an hadith and saying, How many messengers did God send? Then he said, according to the hadith, they said the messengers, messenger answered by saying 310 and something. Let me write it. I don't know if it's decimals or whatever number he's calling. The number of people. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please, you listen carefully. I'm going to write it down. 310 and 10 and something. I'm going to put it on the screen. Very big enough. <laughs> Allah, Allah, hey. sectarians. Hmm. Oh my God, oh my God. Three, 310 and something. How, how, how? I don't understand. How? 310 and something. I can't think far. Seriously, I can't think far. 310 and something. The number of messengers. 310 and something. Ladies and gentlemen. They ask him, how many number of messengers 
somebody like Yasir Kadi is sitting down there and he says 310 and something, right? 310 and something. Oh, I forgot to put H there, yeah? Now, if we have to write this down into numbers, remember, he says the number of messengers, so meaning the number of people, right? So 310... 310, if they are the number of people, if you say and something, which means point something, so it can be 1.1 1. 1, or 0. 0.2 or 0. 0.3 or 0. 0.4. So let's make it point, decimals, right? But we put point there. Uh, the number of people can never be in this decimals, right? It's just like saying the number of uh the number of cars which are which are which are countable they can never be in in decimals so when you say 310 and something and it's not specific but this guy say is the exact number i don't know which university that guy graduated i have no idea and this guy is a scholar how so he says 310 and something. And when we say exact, he says it's the exact number. Oh my God. Exact means marked by strict and particular and complete accordance with facts. Unchangeable. But this guy again went further to say this number seems to be reoccurring of have variance as time goes on. This is what he says. This number keeps reoccurring in such a way in variance. 310 and something, the number of messengers. And this guy said it's exact number. Then they ask him the number of prophets. Then he says 124,000. And then he went ahead to say the prophet's duty and the messenger duty are not the same. So there's a difference, right? But whenever God says, Atiwullaha wa Atiwu Rasul, this, this same mushriks again will tell you that obey the prophet. Whilst God is saying, obey God and obey the messenger, the foolish mushriks will go ahead and tell you, Atiwullah wa Atiwu Nabi. If you ask them, open one verse in the Quran and show me where it says, obey the prophet, it becomes an issue. But this same mushriks are sitting down in this video telling you, the messengership duty is not the same as a prophethood duty. They are different. They are not the same. So now he went ahead to say God sent 124,000 prophets, but he sent only 310. I wonder which number is that. <laughs> 310 and something. I wonder. I wonder. The number of human beings, 310 and something, Husband Allah wa Nimal Wakil. You heard him clearly yourselves. Yasir Kadi. Huh? Kabi Lang, huh? the Senegalese based in Italy, who is doing the distance, will just tell you this what you have as scholars. Good. 310 and something. And initially, when he said that, you heard some of the audience, they were laughing. So when they laughed, then he says, yeah, of course, Rasul, Rasul. So it means Rasul says it, don't question. <laughs> don't question, don't use your logic, don't use your reasoning. Because the Hadith, Rasul says it, of course, Rasul. So don't question, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's how we have sheep. The, the sectarian religions are full of sheep. Yes, sheep. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on Yasir Kadi. It's a waste of time. Let's put him aside. I'm going to another guy, Numan Ali Khan, who, who is also a Pakistani born, I think born in Germany or something, and moved to US, and now he's based in US. I think he's the founder of Bayina Institute, right, in US. And he is also somebody, the mainstream uh, people, like in the mainstream, who is also considered as a scholar because he does the lectures and whatever, he teaches people online 
and people take him somewhat seriously and they think this guy is learned. Well, I, I seem to agree with some of the his, his stance or some of the things he says because he's somewhat intelligent, but he's dangerous. He's devious. I will tell you for a fact, he is. So I'm going to play some of his two videos and I tell you how devious he can be. So pay attention. And the other extreme is, we believe in the Sunnah of the Prophet just as we believe in the Quran and we see them as inseparable from each other. I would even say that the first tafsir of the Quran, the first explanation and the application of the Quran is the living model of the Prophet The disservice, however, is when you look at anything, the Book of Allah or the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, in a shallow way. In other words, you read a hadith somewhere, a translation, a shallow translation of a hadith somewhere, some tradition. You don't know the context. You don't know who the Prophet was talking to. وسلم, you don't know what transpired thereafter, you didn't dig deeper into what actually the entire context of the speech is and you start drawing all kinds of conclusions. This is a problem. This is why the hadith sciences are, a, it's a sensitive science, just like Quranic studies is, it's a sensitive science. I've learned over the last you know, few years that the more you respect context, the, more, the better your understanding gets. And the more disregarding you are of context, you know, the way you just don't even acknowledge what's, what did Allah say before, what did He say after. Even textual context, I'm not even saying historical context, even textual context. If you pluck things out from the middle of a conversation, you're not going to understand what was wholly being said. Allah did say the book is clear, but that doesn't mean that it's overly simple. In order to have clarity, you have to apply your mind. Allah expects human beings to reflect on the book. It's not going to come that you just open the book, read something, oh, it should be clear to me. Why isn't it clear to me? Well, you know, mathematics is very clear, but that doesn't mean that it's simple. Physics is very clear for people who study physics. That doesn't mean that it's simple. There's a difference between clarity and simplicity. The book of Allah and the deen of Islam certainly is clear. And some parts of it, as a matter of fact, are simple too. But the Quran actually never uses the word simple. It always uses the word clear and clarifying. And in order to arrive at clarity, one has to apply their mind. And that's why Allah constantly asks believers, أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Why don't you apply your intellect? Why don't they reflect? Why don't they think deeply? This is something expected of us. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the first portion of the video, I don't, I don't agree with him. The first portion of the video I just played, I don't agree with him. The second portion of the video, I agree with him, right? Now, so this is how logic works when you are listening to a smart person, you know, an intelligent person making, giving a speech. And it only takes knowledgeable people to be liars. A knowledgeable person is good at lying, right? Uh huh. Because an ignorant person or a dumb person is not good at lying. They can't lie. You see how, how, how it is. So whenever you have a liar, a liar takes a lot of deep thinking to, to understand how your logic works before he lies to you because he knows how he can escape. So every liar is, an, is a knowledgeable person, right? And not only knowledgeable, it's intelligent. So take the, the, the instance of fraudsters, people who do scamming online, or they are very intelligent and they are very smart. So that's why they are devious. Now, when you have somebody who is devious, he has a tactic in order to convince you to believe in what he has to tell you. But mind you, he will always use his intelligence to talk to you, but not use facts to prove something to you. No. He has to use his smartness, but not proofs. Do you see how it works? This is why a person is devious. So whenever you have a liar, a liar cannot prove their, their statements or whatever they say. Liar cannot prove it. What a liar does, it, it's he outsmarts outs you by using intelligence. You see, just like the devil did to Adam, right? God prohibited him from the, uh, going next to the tree. The devil told him, no, your Lord did not prohibit you. He just doesn't want you to become immortals or angels or whatever. You see how it works. Okay, good. So let's come back to Numan Ali Khan. Before I, I go into what he said, you saw where he was standing. They have Allah here and they have Muhammad here. You saw the, the two names on the side of the wall, Allah and Muhammad, and they put an equal level on parallel 
you know, ground. When you go in the masjids, they have the same concepts. Remember, to God, God has no equals and he doesn't have anyone compared to him. So that alone is even a comparison to put God here and Muhammad here as if they are lovers or they are, you know, couples. You understand? So this, they tell you uh, subconsciously, they are telling you that you cannot do with, 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 <laughs> you cannot practice anything without this two. It has to do with Muhammad, uh, not my messenger. Muhammad, the imposter, the fake one they give you in the mainstream, right? From the hadith, not from the Quran. The Muhammad in the Quran is doesn't have the pedigree they are giving him. No, he doesn't have that same pedigree. They are putting him there. Because the Muhammad of the Quran was told to tell the people to invoke God alone in the masjid, masajids. But today, when you go, according to the Muhammad of the Hadith they have, you have to invoke him together with God. So you see the difference. So again, this guy brought the notion of the Sunnah, right? How the Sunnah interprets the Quran and explains the Quran for you. He didn't quote any verse to back it up. Then he went further to tell you that you shouldn't just read a verse in the Quran and then think you have understood it because you take it out of context. Then he mentioned context. I agree with him 100% when he went to that field concerning context. And for my years of experience and me being somebody who has translated a fully translated Quran, I can tell you sectarians are not good at using context in the Quran. No. They have been taught, indoctrinated to use context outside the Quran. So to them, context is found in Hadith, not in the Quran. To them, you don't read the Quran to get context. You read a passage in the Quran, go outside, go to some garbage book to get a context. It doesn't work that way. That's not how context work. So you see, intelligently, he says something which is somewhat true, but he himself is playing with your conscience in a manipulative way. So what I'm trying to do is to help you, the audience, when you are listening to scholars, even including myself, if you deem to seem that I am knowledgeable, if you are listening to me, there's a way you have to be paying attention to the, to the discourse or what I, whatever I'm saying. Because I'm a human being, to air is human. So sometimes it's not as if maybe I might intentionally want to lie to you, but the issue is I might be talking and get carried away and might make a slip of a tongue or say something which maybe I didn't intend to say that. But because you are just listening for the sake of listening and thinking, oh, Baba Shwaib there is knowledgeable than me or he, whatever he says, oh, I think he's knowledgeable. So that's it. Then you are in danger. So this is why Quran chapter 33 verse 67 is cautioning you don't be of those on the day of judgment who come and say, our Lord, we have obeyed our masters and our leaders and they misled us from the way. Because you never verified what they told you. You never cross-checked. You just got up and followed like a sheep. So I'm just giving you the heads up. So when you listen to the uh, Numan Ali Khan, Numan Ali Khan went ahead to say the Quran says it is clear, but it is never simple. I agree with him. When something can be clear, but it doesn't mean it's simple. Do you understand? So he gave certain examples whereby it's in line with what he says. Yes, but he is saying that in favor of the Hadith books. That is where I don't agree. Do you see the difference? I agree with the notion of the statement he's saying. God never said the Quran is simple. Simple. When we say simple or easy, we say Sometimes what people will quote the verse in the Quran, chapter 50, uh, 50 Surah Al-Kamar, chapter 54, verse 17, where God says, Quran lil zikr. God says, we have made the Quran simple or easy for the remembrance. He didn't say we have made it easy for understanding. No, there's a difference. Quran lil zikr fahal min mudakir. In that passage, it doesn't say we have made the Quran easy to understand. 
The word understand is not found in that verse. He said, we have made the Quran easy for the remembrance. Yes, you can remember a passage of the Quran. That's why people can memorize the Quran. Yes, it's easy. Because God has made it in such a way that it can be easy to comprehend, uh, to, uh, to remember something easily in order to, to repeat it. Do you see how it goes? But as for saying it is easy to understand, no, it doesn't. But yes, it says it's clear. It's a clear book because it brings issues evident, clear. Whenever we are arguing about something, let's say God, we say, hey, God says uh, watching TV is haram. Somebody said, hey, God says some watching TV is haram. I can say, okay, no problem. Open the Quran, let's check. Where does it say watching TV is haram? Now the person is stuck because it's easy to be remembered. So find a verse, give me, where is it? It just have 114 chapters, 6,236 verses. It's a small book. So open it. Show me where does it say? Because it has to make issues evident, clear, mubin. So that's why God calls it kitab and mubin. And mind you, you can be holding a pen in your hand like this. If this pen is clear, everybody can see it's a pen. It's in my hand. But within five minutes, you can be looking for the same pen while it is stuck on your shirt somewhere there. It is clear. Everybody can see it. it's hanging on you. But you can be looking for it. Where's my pen? Hey, excuse me. Did you see my pen? Where did I put it? The other person looking at you will be smiling and say, do you not see? Don't you have eyes? As soon as they say, don't you have eyes? You look over, you see it. That's exactly how the Quran works. It's mubin, but doesn't mean everybody will just take it and open it and see it clearly there. No, you need somebody to point it over and say, oh, it is there. Check that verse there. It's there. So when you check, you say, oh, mashallah, jazakallah, I've seen it. Simple. That is how the Quran is clear. But it doesn't say it's easy to understand. You see the difference? So in this instance, I, ad I agree with that guy, Numan Ali, but he has a different agenda. And I'm going to show you in the next video I'm going to play concerning what he said. So pay attention. There is another rational argument that is brought up and that's, you know, I even if, let's just say, I want to I wanna believe what the Prophet had to say. I want to believe hadith. I want to believe that the Prophet's wisdom is worthwhile and his his practices, his teachings, his, you know, his daily rituals, etc. I want to learn about those things. But how am I supposed to trust that these people who narrated these hadith, these who, the, the transmitters of this tradition, who passed it on from one person to another person to another person, how am I supposed to know that these people are trustworthy, that I can rely on them, you know? Because Allah said He protected the Qur'an, He never said He protected Hadith. So how am I supposed to do, you know, to, to, to make do with this? The simple answer to that, even though it's an elaborate, exhaustive, academic discussion, and inshallah ta'ala on the Facebook group, I will also put some, some resources for you guys to read, bi'idhnillah. But um, what I want you to think about is as follows. The people who transmitted Islam are the same bunch of people. It's not one group of people that transmitted the Qur'an and another group of people that transmitted hadith. These companions were entrusted with transmitting the word of Allah and the teachings of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi to the next generation, which passed it down to the next, which passed it down to the next. The Qur'an itself is originally an oral tradition. It's predominantly an oral tradition. The writing of it, the, 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 you know, the coming together of it is actually a formality that was necessary down the road. But originally, ayatun bayinatun fi sudur al utul ilm, Quran itself will declare these are miraculous signs lying in the chests of those who've been given knowledge. Overwhelmingly, people around the world, hundreds of thousands of people, memorized the Quran within the first generation. That's how the Quran actually spread. And that's actually how the Sunnah of the Prophet actually spread originally through these reliable people, the same people we rely on for the Quran. What I'm saying is Allah did, when Allah said He will protect the Quran, He didn't send us some box from the sky that the Quran came in and you couldn't touch it anymore. He used people of reliable chests to preserve the Quran. And it's those very people that have brought us this tradition, this incredible tradition of the Prophet Yes, it requires rigor to find out whether or not a statement is actually attributed to him. Just like it required rigor as a matter of fact, 
And the rigor was applied to even the Qur'an, even every ayah of the Qur'an. The tawatur is always there. It's actually the same principles were actually applied to the Qur'an itself. So questioning hadith, actually, then you actually end up questioning Qur'an itself. Because it is coming from the same historical tradition. This guy deserves no. <laughs> Allah walu manga. Is that? Oh my God! Oh my God! These people are playing with our conscience, big time. I played this two and a half minutes video again by Numan Ali Khan. He never quoted a verse, no verse. He said he's winning some desires. Free of charge. And he said the same people who transmitted the Quran are the same people who transmitted the Hadith. That's a lie. A big lie. Yes, a big lie. The popular Hadith you have today is Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, Jami al Tirmizi and Abu Dawood and Sunan Ibn Nisa. These same people who transmit this Hadith, are they the same people who transmitted Quran? The answer is no. Okay, let's go, let's go back in time. According to your garbage hadith, you said there was Umar, there was Ali, there was Abu Bakr, there was Uthman. These people, did they transmit hadith? Did they transmit hadith? Are they the transmitters of the Quran as well? The answer is no. According to your garbage hadith, you said Usman took all the types of coffee, copies of the Quran, bent all of them, and he left one version. You believe in that garbage because his hadith is still telling you that garbage, right? Good. You went ahead to say the Quran was orally transmitted, and same way the hadith was orally transmitted, right? Good. So all this while, you people keep repeating the same statement like a sheep. You keep repeating because whatever you keep repeating, which is a lie, becomes the truth in the people's head. And this thing you heard Numan Ali Khan saying is all over the Sunnis. You hear the same statement they keep telling you. Ask them for proof. Wallahi, they can't prove it. They can't. You just then put them to the test. Whenever you hear a scholar say this statement, tell him to prove to you. Give me the proof. Where I did one transmitter who transmitted the Quran, right, from the Prophet's time and transmitted the same hadith from the Prophet's time. Bring, give me one transmitter and tell them I'm waiting. They will never bring you the answer to the day of judgment. You put them to the test. I'm just helping you, giving you the weapons in order to understand how scholars play with your conscience. And again, at the end, he said, if you are rejecting the hadith, then you are rejecting the Quran because they are the same. You see the foolishness again. Do you see the errant garbage and foolishness this guy is telling you? Because he has been paid to say that rubbish. Quran chapter 17, verse 88. Let's see if what Numan Ali Khan is saying is true. And let's check what God is saying. Who is more truthful than God in a statement? Is it Numan Ali Khan or is it God himself? So let's go and check what God says. In Quran chapter 17, verse 88, God says, Kul, la ini jida atil insu wal jinni ala an yatu bi mithlihi haza la Qur'ani la yatu na bi mithlihi wa law kana baaduhum li baadun zahira. Do you see what the verse says? He's telling the messenger to say, say. Then he says, la ini jida tama atil insu wal jinni. If the, the humans and the genes will confer in order to bring the like of this Quran, this Quran I'm reading to you, this, not that, this Quran, they cannot bring, bring the like of it. Even if they were assistants to each other, they can't bring the like of this Quran. So ask any foolish mushrik out there. 
the Quran and the Hadith, are they the same? If they are foolish enough, they will say yes. If they are not foolish, they will say no. If they say no, then ask them, which of the two books come from God? They will tell you the Quran. So how then are you telling me if I reject the Hadith, it's just like I'm rejecting the Quran? Are you in your right senses? Did God say that? Did God say the garbage Hadith you have is his book? Then why are you telling me if I reject the Hadith, it's just like I'm rejecting the Quran because they came the same way? Is that what God tell, told you, that they came the same way? Or are you just repeating what your scholars tell you out of foolishness? Quran chapter 6, verse 115. God clearly told the prophet, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ سِدِكًا وَأَذِلَ لَا مُبَدِّلَ لِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَهُوَ صَمِيُّ الْعَلِيمُ Quran chapter 6, verse 115. He says, The word of your Lord is complete in truth and justice, and there is no alteration to his words. So it clearly tells us at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, the word of God is already completed. It was complete. Nothing was left. Even the disbelievers, the kafirs at the time of Muhammad, they bore witness that he wrote the Quran. Yes, he wrote it. He wrote the verses of the Quran, Quran chapter 25, verse 5 to verse 6. Go and check for yourself. Quran chapter 25, verse 5 to verse 6. And then we just step so low and listen to these foolish scholars. I repeat, foolish scholars lying to you. You don't cross check. You don't examine. You don't hold them accountable. You don't put them and ask them critical questions. And yet you made them question your credentials and tell you, uh, uh, where have you studied? Uh, which, which university have you attended? Uh, what? The prophet who brought the Quran, tell me which university he has attended before bringing you such a book from God. So you tell us these scholars have to go and be indoctrinated by the so-called uh, you know, Azhar universities before they come and tell you about Islam and you refuse to use your logic, your, your intelligence to question what these people are telling you, right? So none of what Mufti, uh, this Numan Ali Khan said can be proven. He cannot prove and none, no scholar on earth can prove that. If any scholar out there tells you you can prove that statement, I'm available, Baba Shwai. Tell him to find me. I'll put my phone number up there. Let them find me. And let's discuss this. Wallahi lazim. And you see how I'll handle them for you to, to, to see their foolishness. Right? Good. Now, I'm going to break down some instance prior to this video, what Numan Ali can say. Right? I want to break down some instance to help you understand a certain, a particular point. And I'll be coming to read the, the uh, questions and answers people have asked so far because I wasn't paying attention to the statements. I'll come to that, inshallah, so that I, I, I address some of your points. Now, according to Numan Ali Khan, he said we have to rely, we should rely on, on the transmitted of the hadith. He said God says he will protect the Quran, but he has to protect it through human beings. Is that what God told you? That he... he <laughs> God said it in the Quran that he will protect it through human beings. He never said that. It is out of this foolishness of these scholars, they are now repeat, saying such things. That God says he will protect the book through human beings. He never said that. There's no verse where he says he will protect the book through human beings. He never said that. No. Good. Now, one thing God cautions us in Quran chapter 6 verse 102. He said, that is Allah, your Lord. There is no God except him creator of all things so worship him for he is a representative over all things he is a representative that is when we say wakila or wakil someone who is a representative so take him as your representative now this statement god told the children of, of israel quran chapter 17 verse 2 he says wa atayna musa al we gave Moses the book and made it a guidance for the children of Israel that do not take a representative, a representative besides me, meaning don't, don't take somebody you rely on besides God, even though God gave Moses the book. So 
automatically we have people who tell you I have to rely on Moses. No, God says, do not take a representative besides me. So God has to be the representative, what you're working, nobody else. When you go to Quran chapter 6, verse 107, he told Prophet Muhammad the same statement. He says, and if God had willed, they will not have associated others, meaning become idol worshippers. But he left them to become because they chose to become. So then he says, and we have not appointed you, Muhammad, as a guardian over them. We didn't put them as a guardian to guard you, to be your, 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 your guardian angel or what, something over you. Then God says, no, are you their what? Advocate, meaning somebody you can rely on. They are wakil. God didn't send Muhammad to be your wakil. So when we define a true believer, the definition of a true believer according to the Quran, it is somebody who has to rely on God. And when I mean God, that is Allah. You don't rely on anybody else when it comes to the matters of your deen. It is not for you to go and rely on anybody else but God. So Quran chapter 8 verse 2 to verse 4. Let's see the definition of a true believer. Right? So when we say a true believer, in order to understand the structure of a true believer, you don't need to rely on an outside source or an external, external book in order to become a true believer. So Quran chapter 8 verse 2 to verse 4, it says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتُهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ So you see where the word wakil comes in. It was used as a verb here. Huh? So upon their Lord, they rely on their Lord. So this word relying, yatawakkal, comes from the word the wakil, to, to, for somebody to represent you, that you rely upon. So God says, الَّذِينَ يُكِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَمِمَّا رَزَقَنَاهُمْ يُنْفِكُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْحَقِّ لَهُمْ دَرَجَاتٌ إِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَمَغَفِرَةٌ وَرِزِقٌ كَرِيمٌ So what is the definition of a true believer here? We can clearly see God is telling us that believers are only those whom, when God is mentioned, their hearts are fearful. And when his verses are recited, not garbage hadith recited, when his verses, not any garbage sunnah recited, when his verses are recited, not any garbage book recited to you, when his verses are recited to them, they increase in faith. Not any garbage hadith book recited to you. Listen carefully. Then he says, they increase in faith and they rely on their Lord. You don't rely on Sahih Bukhari. Neither did you rely on any uh, false sahaba they tell you about. Neither did you rely on any foolish scholar they are telling you about. You rely on what? Your Lord. The ones who establish the salat and from what we have provided them, they disperse, meaning they give to charity. Those are the true believers. For them are degrees at their Lord, as well as forgiveness and generous sustenance. Quran chapter 8, verse 2 to verse 4. This are the definition of a what? True believer. You rely on God. You don't take another representative other than God. Muhammad was not sent to be your wakil. Neither did God advise you to take a wakil other than him. So you have to take God as your wakil. That is enough. The reason why you can't take Muhammad as your wakil is clearly stated in Quran chapter 2, verse 272. God clearly told Muhammad, Laisa alayka hudahum, walakin Allah yadi man yasha. Their guidance is not upon you. However, God guides whomever he wills. So if our guidance is based on Muhammad, then we can also take Muhammad as a representative, our wakil. But no, God didn't send him to be an hafiz over you. Neither did he send him to be your wakil over, over you. Do you understand? Muhammad was never in that criteria. So now how much less his, his, what the his so-called sahaba that you are talking about in the garbage books? How much less? Or how much more? <laughs> now, there is something that uh, uh, Numan Ali Khan said that I want us into. Uh, Sister Aisha was welcome. Yeah, salam to you all, Marwan and uh, yeah, Khalifa Abdul 
I couldn't get a chance to be reading the comments. I'll come to that, inshallah. Uh, salam, Salis Naganka. Mm -hmm. What we need to pay attention is Numal Ali Khan said something. I want us to go over that and I will elaborate something. I'll break something down to, under, to help you understand how the context and the subjects work in the Quran so that you don't have to rely on an external source because you've been lied to. They will deviate you. They will lie to you. They will take you away from the way of God. Quran chapter 6, verse 153. Quran chapter 6, verse 153. God says, and that this is my path, which is straight. So follow it and do not follow other ways. Meaning, do, do not follow ways. He gave you one way. Because in Fatiha, chapter 1 of the Quran, when you pray to God, you say, surat al -mustakim, guide us to the straight path. You didn't say, guide us to the straight paths. You told God, guide us to the straight path, which is one. This is what you told God. So now God is giving you the answer in Quran chapter 6, verse 153. And that this is my path, which is straight. So follow it. And this, T-H-I-S, denotes something in front of you, which is the Quran. He says, follow it. Then he told you, do not follow ways, because you told God, guide us to the straight path. One. Now he pointed the path to you and said, follow it and do not follow other ways. Then you'll be what? Separated from his way. So what does the Hadith do to you? It separates you from the way of God. That is why people become mushriks when they follow the Hadith books. And that is why I'll call them mushriks till I leave this earth. It's evident. You understand? Good. So now let's go back to the notion. Hey, salam, I was Let's go back to the notion I wanted to address. I want to give you the helping hand in order to understand how the subject and context work in the Quran, right? So I'll give you some examples. Based on what Numan Ali Khan said, I told you, I agree with part of what he said, but I don't agree with most of what he said, right? So now, this is how it works. I'll put this, let me put this in a notepad in order to maximize it. So that people can see what I'm what I want to see. Now, when you go in in in, in uh, when you go to study Arabic, that is Luga, Luga to Arabia, or you want, want to understand Ihira, that is how Nahu works, syntax. If you want to understand how it works according to their own rule, but we will be implementing what the Quran says so that we get we don't get missing along the way. Uh -huh, because remember. The Quran was sent to us to become as a guidance for mankind and the proof of the guidance and the what? al furqan the criterion. So the Quran is to help you to decipher or to differentiate between wrong and right. This is the purpose of the Quran, to serve as a guidance and to give you proofs and then to help you to differentiate things. That is as al furqan right? So now when you take the notion of uh, context, when we say context, we say siyak. Or siyak al kalam, that is to know the context of a statement or, 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 of, or of a given a word, to understand how it works. Siyak al kalam in Arabic, when we say context, this is how it works. I want to break it down in order to you how you need to apply context in the Quran. But first of all, you will have to understand how the subject works. Without understanding subject, you can't understand context. So now, let me put, uh, share this. Let's understand. Siak. Now, when we say uh, siak, when you say context, right? Discourse that surrounds a language unit and helps to determine its interpretation, right? Discourse that surround a language unit and helps to detect interpretation. Yeah, what we call text. That is siyak al kalam. Context, siyak al kalam. Good. Now, what I want you to understand is when you take a discourse in a language, whether in Arabic, whether in English, 
whether in any language. For instance, for people who have read the book Romeo and Juliet, written by William Shakespeare, right? Romeo and Juliet was written in the ancient English language, right? When you take that English and you are reading it into the modern standard English of today, it, it will not make sense to you. It will be full of gibberish, right? It will not make sense to you. At that time when it was written, it makes full sense based on the context. If you put it in the based on the subject and context being discussed, you understand it totally. If you bring it into the language we are using today, this modern day English, it will make no sense. It will be a nonsensical book. So now, when you are dealing with context, which is Yakal Kalam, always you have to understand how the discourse work. So it's a discourse that surrounds a language unit and helps to determine its interpretation. So you can take a book, three books in English language, but they are all based on different subjects and contexts, even though they are all written in English, but words there will not mean the same thing. This word will be written here, but it means something different. That same word you find it in this book will mean something different because the subjects being discussed is different based on the context. That is why there are certain words you know from here, it doesn't carry the same weight in this, in this or that book. You see how it works. So now, what I want to help my audience to understand is, you should always understand how subjects, what subjects is being discussed before you can put things into context. If you don't understand which subject is being discussed, you can never put things into context because then it will become your own context and you are out of context. So you need to understand how context works when you're relying on the Quran on its own to understand the subject. Now, when we say subject, I share a screen. When we say subject, let me go back to sharing the screen again. Then that instance down for people to, to, to get by me. When we say subject, eh? in Arabic, we can use the word mawdu. Some people can say topic, right? Or we can say uh, muhtawa, muhtawa, or we can say uh, uh, mawdu. Let's use the word mawdu, right? So when we say the subject, the thing or area being discussed. So at a particular given time, when I'm discussing about something, the choices of words that I might use might have a different context, B different from the way you used to know it, right? For instance, if I use the word kill, kill, K-I-L-L, -L, kill, I put it here, K-I-L-L, -L. the word kill, this word, kill, I can put it in the context based on the subject I'm discussing. I can put it in a context where it doesn't mean to literally murder somebody. But before you can understand the kill I'm using has nothing to do with actually killing somebody or murdering somebody, then you have to understand the subject first before you can put it into context. So when we say understanding Siyak al-Kalam, context, it doesn't always just go that you take a book and you are reading and then you think you understand the context. That's not how it works. You need to first understand the subject being discussed first. So that's why when we go for our academics in the classroom, before a teacher starts teaching you, they first of all write the subject on the, on the, and on the board, whether whiteboard or blackboard, they write it on the board. Then now they give you the definition of the word. After defining that word, then they now help you to put it into context so that you understand the thing or area being discussed so that you don't play with words the way you like. So understand that first when you are approaching the Quran so that no foolish scholar out there will lie to you by using other books to twist the narrative around and lie to you. Just like when you take the translations of the Quran online, you see them putting words into brackets and putting their own meanings to words. You see, this is how they cause deviance, and I call them devious sectarian scholars. Now, let's go back to 
the hint I'm giving you. So for instance, I'm going to give you five examples before uh, I might bring the topic to an end, right? Now the first example, when you are listening to a scholar or you are, you are listening uh, Yeah, Salam Muhammad Isaka. No problem. After the program, you can replay and then you watch, right? Uh huh. Sorry about that. First of all, when you are listening to somebody giving, uh, like giving a speech or in a discourse, don't draw conclusions. Don't be fast to put judgments. Don't be fast to 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 decide things. Try to understand the statement till it ends. If you don't understand, go back and understand and ask for the subject, right? and ask, oh, what is the topic? Or what is the subject being discussed? When you are told the subject, you can come back and put the things into context. Without understanding the subject, whatever context you put is your own context and it's no more the main topic of discussion. So number one, I'm going to help you out to understand that. Now, listen and listen carefully. For the audience, listen and listen carefully. When you are listening to scholars, this is how you have to program your mind. Quran chapter 39 verse 18, God says, Those who listen to the word and follow the best of it, of it, the word that you are listening, the word, which is the Quran, and follow the best of it. Those who listen to the word and follow the best of it, they are those whom God has guided, and they are those who possess intelligence. So intelligence plays a major role when you are listening to a discourse, a statement, a word, talk, a discussion, a conversation, whatever you are listening to, right? So this is why journalism, people who go to uh, study journalism, who are journalists, they have been taught on how to listen and cherry pick and choose and pick certain things and they are easily they can easily take your words out of context and take the discussion out of context so this is why when you listen to when you read newspapers or you you are you're fond of listening to the news don't always stick to the headline don't stick to the headline always jump into the main discussion to understand the context when you are stuck with the headline you take things out of context because then you put your own context and you are out of coverage area. So these sectarian scholars have been trained very well. When they quote a verse, they will quote a verse like, then they will put their own context. They will quote verse, they never fulfill the verse. They will stop there and they put their own context. They will quote a verse, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ then they will put their own context. You see how they go. Then they will say, "Atiu la wa atiu Rasul." They will quote a verse. They say, "Wa in kuntum to hibun Allah fatabi uni." And if you should love God, then follow me. So then they say they put their own context and they say, "This is why the prophet say you should have to follow him or follow his sunnah." Do you see how they play with your conscience? Because you haven't trained your brain to be an intelligent listener. So this is a weapon I'm giving my audience. Number one, I'm going to make a statement here. And I bet you, most of you listening will draw conclusion before I finish my statements. But this is how it works. So in the, in the first place, the statement starts like this. There is a guy who cheated during the time he was dating a lady from Ghana. There was a guy who cheated during the time he was dating a lady from Ghana. And that happened in the year 2022. Now this is the statement. Now, when you give people a chance to put this into context, they are left with their whims and desires to guess. Do you know what they will do? Because you mentioned the word cheated. So they will circulate this word cheated, and you mentioned the word lady. 
So they circulate the lady. If you ask them to put it in the context, instead of them to smartly ask you for the subject, they will go ahead to put their own context just because they saw the word cheated and they saw the word lady. So they will assume the guy cheated the lady. But the context, you need to understand the subject first before you can put it into context. So what is the subject? It was about exams during his time in school. So he, the guy, cheated in the exams during the time he was dating the lady in the year 2022. So you see, in the statement, I use the word dead lady, but you don't understand the subject. So how can you know that lady I'm talking about? Because the specific statement there is to specify the word lady so that you will know that this is a definite article. But if you don't know the subject, how can you know what I'm talking about? So if you hurry up to put your own context, you are in limbo. And this is what most people do when it comes to uh, understanding uh, the, the doctrine in, in Islam. You see, so when I started the statement, you might think I'm talking about cheating in terms of relationship, that the guy may be cheated. He went behind his girlfriend. No. Do you see how it works? But if you leave the subject out and I tell you put it into context, you miss the context because you are only going to assume the context because you don't know the subject of discussion. So the cheating I mentioned has nothing to do with the relationship, but instead it is talking about the exams, which is the subject. But because you don't know the subject, you assume you know the answer to the statement I just uh, uh, phrased that. So do you see how context works? You need to understand subject first before you put things into context. The second example, I'm talking about Barcelona and Real Madrid. For those who watch football, Barcelona is a football team from Spain and Madrid is a football team from Spain. I used to be a Real Madrid fan. I'm just going to give you an example. Now, all of a sudden, I'm discussing with somebody in a hall. We were having a discussion. And it's about Barcelona and Real Madrid. Then I told the friend that, oh, Madrid must win against Barcelona. They have to win. They have to win this match because there's no chance for them to win the league. So they have to win. So while discussing, then I said, they should surely kill them. They have to kill them. So when I said they have to kill them, a third person walked into the room. Prior to the person coming to the room, I was talking to a friend. Only two of us were having a discussion about Real Madrid and Barcelona. Then I said Madrid must win against Barcelona. Then now I changed the statement to use the context, a word in the context, by saying they have to kill them. Now, when I said they have to kill them, I only use a pronoun. Now, I didn't use the subject itself for the discussion. I, I changed it into a pronoun. So now the pronoun is determining that I'm talking about specific type of people, some people. But the third person who walked into the room, all of a sudden, he heard me saying they have to kill them tomorrow. They have to kill them tomorrow. Now, this third person who just walked in, if he is an inquisitive person, right, what will happen is, without asking for the subject we are discussing, if you ask him to put whatever we are saying into context, he's left with assumption and his opinions. What he will say is, oh, you're telling, you think somebody is going, somebody going to kill somebody tomorrow? Or oh, who is going to kill who? So even if he's still left unanswered that we don't give him the subject, he will go and tell somebody that I heard Brother Shribe telling somebody that they have to go and kill somebody. Meanwhile, the subject gives you the clue to the context because assuming if the person knows the subject, the context will have been easy because then he will know me saying Madrid have to kill Barcelona will make sense because I use the word kill. But because I left the word Madrid and I left the word Barcelona to change it into pronoun by using they have to kill them, that word kill can have multiple meanings based on context. 
So it is on that context you understand what I meant by saying kill. But without you knowing the subject, how can you put my words into context? So you have to listen to the word and follow the best of it. You don't just listen and then put your own context or your words and think you know. It doesn't work that way. And remember, Quran chapter 16, verse 89, God says, We have sent down the book to you. We have revealed the book to you as a clarification for all things. So the book on its own has its own subject. And then it has its own context. Because it clarifies everything for you. Quran chapter 24, verse 18, God is the one who clarifies the verses. So you need to put his verse into his context and have the subject that he has given you in order to understand the line of discussion he's telling you about. That's all the Quran is about. The third example. To show you that people can take words out of context without actually understanding the subject. I'm going to say a statement. Before I finish the statement, a lot of you will have judged me already before I, I finish. And this is how the statement starts. I, 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 I slept with two women. I slept with two women. Now, listen, I have not finished the statement, but a lot of you are judging me already. But this is how it works. I slept with two women on the same bed. I have not finished the statement, but a lot of you are judging me already. Do you know why you are judging me? Because I use the word slept and I use the word women. Sleep, women. So what comes to your mind? You put your own context in your head without trying to understand the subject I'm talking about. So let me finish my statement before you understand the subject. I slept with two women on the same bed when I was a child, and that was my mom and my aunt on the same bed. Because they are the two women, and I slept with them on the same bed. But because I used the word slept, you might be interpret interpreting it as sex. I wasn't talking about sex because that's not the subject. You should be patient enough to listen carefully and pay attention. Do you see how it works? So when you are listening to a discourse, don't, don't be fast to put in your own whims and desires. Listen, find the subject and put it into context. Without the subject, you are out of coverage area. When I started the statement, I've not finished, but we have people who draw conclusions and put their own context. So now if you leave such statements hanging, this is where scholars will be lying to you, put their own context to words, and then lie to you and change the narrative because you didn't understand the subject in the first place, whereby the book itself is supposed to give you the subject. So I slept with two women on the same bed when I was a child, and that was my mom and my aunt. There's nothing bad about what I said. There's nothing profane. But because of the way it started, without you understanding the subject of discussion, there's a problem. You take my words out of context because I use the word slept and I use the word women. You see how it works? Good. So now, another example. I take you to the fourth example. The fourth example to understand how context and subjects in the Quran, you need to know. This is just to help build people's understanding on how to approach the Quran, right? So now the fourth example. I'm going to talk about the number eight. The number eight. Listen carefully. I know the subject. You don't know the subject. But let's see how people play with context. Try to understand how context works. You can never put things into context if you don't know the subject. Now, we all know the number eight. Right? I'm going to put it here. We all know the number eight, right? So let me share the screen. Uh, the number eight. I share the screen. What I mean, a figure, yeah? number eight, right? We all know number eight, right? Good. Now, I'm going to make a statement the number eight. 
if you don't understand the context uh, the subject i'm trying to, i'm discussing about you can never put my words into context unless i help you out with the subject so first of all you need to know the subject of discussion in the quran so let's say when you're talking about salat try to understand the subject when you're talking about zakat understand the subject god giving you first if you are talking about hajj try to understand the con uh, the subject first before you can put it into context if you don't understand the subject, you can never get the context right. Put that in the back of your head. That is why in the classrooms for your academics, when the teacher has to start teaching you, they start with the subject before they lead you to the context. So understand how a predicate works in the sentence. Good. So now this is the number eight on the screen. This number eight, let me see if I can use this one here. I'm going to use something here. Uh, now, the next is, is I'm going to make a statement, but people will already draw a conclusion before I finish. When you divide eight into two, right? When you divide eight into two, you can get zero or three. When you divide eight into two, you can get zero or three. I know some of you are already thinking, no, it's not possible. The answer is four. I know you are thinking like that, right? I know some of you are already thinking this way. You are thinking, what is wrong with Brother Shrive? Oh, no. How can, how can eight divided into two give you zero or three? That is not possible. I know some of you are already thinking like this. You see... So now, in order to let you understand how the subject and context works, the number eight you are seeing, if you understand the subject I'm talking about and the context I'm putting it in, then you don't have a problem. But because you don't understand the subject I'm discussing about, if you have to put my words into context, you use your own context by using your opinion and you'll be out of coverage area. All this is as simple as this. When you divide eight into two horizontally, horizontally, when you cut the number eight into two, you divide it horizontally half, what you get is zero. So let's put it to practical example. When you put it into two like this, I'm going to divide it here, like into two like this. Do you see it, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, let me let me see if I can use this one here to to change something here. Uh, what can I put? Okay, let me insert something here to 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 cover it up. Uh, yeah, you see, I divided it in, into two. The down part, if left alone, if I divide by leaving the down part alone. What happens is I get what? Zero. The down part, I get only zero down there. Now, what if I divide it into two like this? One part of it, what it becomes is three. The other part becomes three. So based on the subject and context I am talking about, eight, the number eight, when divided into two, you can get three or you can get zero. Based on when it's divided vertically or horizontally. Now, based on the subject I'm discussing and the context I'm using, this is how you can understand what I actually meant. But if you are listening to me without understanding the subject of discussion, you might pick my words out of context and you say brother shrive said what 
8 divided into 2, the answer is 0 and 3. I think he's crazy. That is what happens when people don't understand a discourse. And that is why when you take a book like Romeo and Juliet in the modern day English, it is difficult to put it into context because it will not make sense to you because you don't understand the subject of discussion in the first place. So I hope you're following the examples I'm giving, ladies and gentlemen. Good. Now, so the last example I'm giving is, the last example, we all know one plus one is equal to two. Generally, this is what we understand it to be. One plus one is equal to what? Two. Generally, this is what we have been taught. Now, what happened is, I can, but I can put it in a different context to make it become three. You just have to pay attention to the subject. This is the hint I'm giving you. In order to put something in the siyak al-kalam, the context, first understand the subject. It makes it easier to understand the context. Because then you will not play with words. Because this is what scholars do. As last two weeks when I played the video of Mufti Menk, God says, Atiwullah wa atiwu rasul. And he said, follow God and follow the messenger. The word atiwu doesn't mean follow. It means obey. But because he changed the word, so he put everything out of context instead of putting it in the context God is talking about. So one plus one, we all know it's called to two. But I can let one plus one become three. Somebody will say, are you a magician? How is that possible? Now, in the simple form, let's try, let's put it to the test and see. I said you have to pay attention to the subject. And what is the subject? The thing or area being discussed will help you to understand the context. Now, this is how it goes. One man, one single man, uh, married to a woman, then got pregnant, pregnant and gave birth to a child. So now they became three. So how does one plus one become three? Now, based on the subject I'm discussing, Let's put it into context. First of all, you have one man who is single. He's only one man, one man like this. Who is single? One man. Then he got married to a woman. So they became two. Then the woman got pregnant. And then she gave birth to a child. So first of all, we had one man who got married to a woman and they became two. So one plus one and then you got three because they had a child so they've become three people so in this context when understanding what the subject is about one plus one became three so in some instances one plus one can become three but when you are dealing with people who don't understand the subject of discussion and they want to take your words out of context. They will just say, Brother Shrive is crazy. He said, can you imagine Brother Shrive telling you one plus one is equal to three? But when people like that come to you, then you, just, uh, you ask them, what is the subject of discussion? Simple. Take them back to the subject. So when sectarians quote verses out of context, always take them back to the subject. When they quote a verse and say, Wama atakum or Rasul Fakuzu, Wama anakum anhu, Fantahu, chapter 59, verse 7, tell them to go back to the subject of discussion. What was God discussing about? Let them finish the verse. You see the context clear because the subject will help you determine the context. You see how it works. Then finally, you can have what we call content. That is what the book is about. That's why Quran is a clarification for all things. Meaning whatever the Quran mentions in the Quran, it gives you the explanation thereof. That's how you have to understand how things work. So understand the object of discussion and the context make a discourse easy to comprehend. So that is why when people become learned, and you are not learned yet. They find topics to be easy whilst you are streaming. Uh, you are struggling to understand what is about because you didn't understand the subject. So when you read a verse, you just take it. When you, somebody finds a verse, he says, oh, when you cut the criminal, the thief and the female thief and the male thief, just cut off their hands. And somebody will say, whoa, why will the Quran say that? 
uh, why would the Quran say kill them wherever you found them? Why does why do you think God will say such a thing like in that way? No, everything has where it starts from, and it has its own context, it has own subjects. So understand how that works first before you draw conclusions. Do you see? Hey, salam, Rasid. Salam, Dabos uh, Amadu. So this is how I want people, when you are listening to scholars, pay close attention. Try, take, listen to what they are saying, put it on the scale. If they give you proof, take it seriously. When they don't give you proofs, <laughs> when they don't give you proofs, be careful. When you see these scholars going on a rant, talking for hours, without a proof and telling you other people and desires and tell you it says this ibn abbas says that even this says ibn taymiyyah said that beware because there is a big propaganda going on that you are not paying attention ladies and gentlemen be careful when you are listening to these top scholars so-called mainstream scholars you call scholars they are very, very devious. Uh, they are devious sectarian scholars. They are devious. Uh -huh. So what I want people to understand is, listen to what Zakir Naik has to say before I end the program. Inshallah. Any person, any scholar, sister, says anything, ask for proof. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 111, Qul hatu bunanakum, produce your proof in kuntum sadiqin, but if you're truthful. Any scholar, therefore, what I say that what Dr. Zakir Naik says in Islam is zero, no value. What Allah says, carry weight. You heard what he said? Mm -hmm. What he, Zakir Naik, says in Islam is zero. What God says, carry it. And you are here, most of you fooling yourselves because you think a scholar who has gone to Azhar and he goes to Egypt University or went to Medina University and you think he knows. You play with your salvation. You don't cross check. You don't scrutinize. You don't ask questions. And you think they know. You play with your conscience and let the scholars tell you you cannot reason. You just use logic in Islam. And you see where your ass will end up being. Aha. Uh -huh. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if, let me let me read some of the comments before I end the program. I, I wasn't reading comments at all. I uh, wasn't uh, doing justice to that. So, let me read some few comments before I go. Uh, I wasn't actually paying attention to the comments section. Uh, for those who have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, I have a YouTube channel, bush 2 g 9 uh, you can find all the lectures I've done throughout the, the years and, 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 and time, uh, most relevant ones. And what I will do next week is, inshallah, I'll be discussing about the Hajj. I'll be talking about the Hajj. I already have a video on YouTube which I talk about the Hajj. Uh, that is, it, is there a pilgrimage in the Quran or is there Hajj in the Quran? I, I talk about a topic like that. You can find it on my YouTube channel in my folder hatch series i talk about hatch but i will be i'll be discussing again concerning the hatch mm -hmm. and the siam the abstinence we have to do the fasting and uh, the animal uh, slaughtering what whatever entails whatever it entails concerning hatch i'll be discussing about that as well so that people can benefit so that's my youtube channel uh below the screen and that is also my whatsapp number anybody has a question right now you can call before i drop the topic or you just write me a message and uh the boss amadu my number is down the screen you can see it's moving there that's a whatsapp number you can try uh salam but you uh let me let me see some of the questions uh being asked because i wasn't paying attention uh salam abu bakar bangura yes you're welcome uh Yeah, uh, Alam Alam Shah said something. Let me let me see if I can put it on the screen. Uh, 
Yes, Alam Shah says, if the fabricated hadith and the Quran is the same, according to Numan Ali Khan, then can he grade the ayat of the Quran as strong or weak? Obviously not. Yeah, that is true. He can't. He can't do that. Yes, he can't. Uh, yes, uh, Dexter also wrote this. He says, they are they are trying any means possible to promote the prophet of the hadith that is evident that is obvious that is the an imposter in the hadith books the prophet you see in the hadith books is not the same prophet in the quran they are different this one uh, that one in the hadith married a six years old girl the prophet in the quran never married a girl because god asked him to marry the women not a, a small girl uh-huh yeah, uh, Salis Jimmy also said concerning the messengers, God told the mess, uh, Muhammad about Quran chapter 40, verse 78. Some messengers God told him about, and some he didn't tell him about. So I don't know where these hadith mongers actually got all these information concerning messengers from. And that's how they keep lying to people. Uh huh. <laughs> yes. The, the <laughs> uh, Mohammed Kamal Din says, I need this video. No, I'll do the video. Uh, Bashir Abu Bakar and Yes, yeah, Salam. Yes, uh, Dexter, Dexter also said, let me share this statement. Dexter says, where, oh. He says, where, where was Sunnah when, when God completed the Quran? Exactly. That's the question I, I asked them. Where, where, was, where was the Sunnah? I, I have no idea where they got it from. Uh -huh. Davis Mark. Yeah. Um, please. Uh, then uh, Sayyid Adam said, I just admire the simplicity with which you explain issues. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it has to be simple because Quran chapter 22 verse 78, God says, Huwa min haraj, is the one who has chosen you and has not placed any difficulty in the deen upon you. So your deen has to be simple. Like things doesn't have to be difficult. That is after you have acquired the knowledge. It's just like driving. Before you start driving, it might seem difficult. Right? Things might feel com complicated. You have to pull the gears you have to you understand you have to watch the traffic you have to check left and right you have to pull the brake check the back but when you actually practice more you, you become you get to the perfection it becomes simple that as time goes on it's simple so whenever you want to explain to, to somebody you explain with simplicity because you have already passed through and you know how it feels so that's how knowledge feels like when you have acquired the knowledge and you can put it into practice and experience when you are going to explain to somebody, it shouldn't be difficult to explain. It should be, it should be with simplicity. You see, and that's what I try to do my best. Uh, yeah. Salam al al Mahmoud. Yeah. Uh, thank you, God. Sayyid Adam. Salam al Jalil. Yes. See you. Allah Jalal al Mahmoud. I see you. Yeah. Salam Jimmy. Baba Sidu. I think, guys, this is where I need to bring the topic to end. Uh, for those who have not been able to. Your questions or what uh, your statements uh tom tom shrednick says if you could if you could answer maybe later what do you think about the sunni saying that the moon split as part of a miracle and a sign apparently there are witnessed and testimonies from around the world i will catch up later thanks for peace uh the quran doesn't back that up as to saying the prophet actually split the moon no right miracles can happen you can see a miracle, fine, right? Uh -huh. To be shown a miracle, just like the issue of Moses splitting the, the sea, you understand? They are, these are miracles God does for people to have faith, but it carries no weight in the Quran, whereby we have to even argue about such such instances. No, you see. Uh, Hamdu Isaku says, brother, I will be happy if you can talk uh, a little about the hat. I'll be doing that next, inshallah. May God permit us, I'll do that. YG, yeah, salam, peace. Uh, thank you, and gentlemen. I think they have to drop the topic for now uh, because I'm almost two hours in the show. I don't want programs to be reaching two hours these days. I want I want it to be less than two hours so that people can get to watch. Uh, yeah, salam, Eddie Debbie Yeah, you're welcome. 
thank you thank you very much uh for for the support i appreciate that uh yes i appreciate that uh thank you very much fatima Machin. uh thank you very much how was you i appreciate your time and support yes i appreciate that uh ladies and gentlemen i have to attend to the family now and uh, this is why i have to bring the topic to an end my water is finished i'm getting exhausted <laughs> And it's part of the jihad, the struggle I have to do for God in order to help my people. It's just like when you are given, when you become a wealthy man, you are not only wealthy because of yourself. It's because of the people around you. When you are knowledgeable, it's not only because of you. It's about the people about you, around you. Whatever you have acquired in life is not only about you. It's about how people, other people can benefit. So this is the best way I can also propagate and spread out uh, the truth to other people in order to help the other people to, to be enlightened so that it will not become an individualistic thing. We can all liberate ourselves from mental slavery based on the way the scholars are, you know, maltreating us in the religion. So we shouldn't stand to be manipulated. We should stand up for the right, question things, use logic, use reasoning. You understand? Seek for proofs, evidences, in order for you to decide whether this is what you want to follow or not. So that's all religion is about, faith, faith. You believe something which you have to use your sound logic to analyze. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Subhana Rabbi, Izzati Amma Isifun was salamu ala al mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Thank you very much, uh, Sharif. And this is where I bring the topic to an end. And let me play this video before I go. I'm where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said, I'm not trying to respond to this to point out that he doesn't know the Quran. Suratul An'am. Chapter 6, verse 115. He read it as, Now, if you pick your Quran, you will see that, uh, Over here. No. Oh. Even I cannot see what I'm trying to find over here. Where my finger is? Oh, really? Oh no, it's turned upside down. 